This is the intro video for the introduction to the oscilloscope and the RC time constant experiment. The first thing that you're going to do in part A is set up the oscilloscope. They first have you press the menu button for channel 1 and adjust your settings, and then you'll press the trigger menu button and again adjust your settings. After you've done that, then you're going to set up your circuit. So for this circuit, you're going to use the Xantrex power supply. So turn that on. Remember to have the green and the black terminals connected together if you're using the 60-1 model. You want to turn current all the way to maximum, and you're going to set your voltage to 8.5. The resistance that you should be hooking up is 1500 ohms. So you're going to use your decade resistance box. So 1000 plus 500. And then it's just positive terminal to one of these, negative terminal to the other one. Then you'll hook it up to your oscilloscope, and you do have to be careful that the more positive end goes to the red terminal and the negative end goes to the black terminal, just because the oscilloscope will not give you accurate values if you don't have ground plugged into its black terminal. So red to red, and black to black, like this. So when you get your circuit hooked into the oscilloscope, you may or may not see anything on the screen. So go ahead and use that Auto Set button to get the image on the screen quickly. So the first thing that you'll notice is that this is a straight line, not a wavy line. And that's because the Xantrex is a DC power supply. So it puts out a constant voltage, and that's what we're seeing on the screen. Another thing I want to point out to you is that there's a little arrow on this side of the screen with the number 1 beside it. That marks the location of ground for channel 1. So our voltage was a positive voltage, that means it's somewhere above ground. So that's what we expected. Now the Auto Set button is not necessarily going to give you the exact values for these settings that they want you to have in the lab manual. So they ask you to change your volts per division to 2 volts. So this number should be 2. So I'll do that now. And of course as soon as I do that, I can't see my signal on the screen anymore. That's okay, we're not done fixing things. They also want you to set your time base setting to 5 milliseconds. So that means that number should be 5 milliseconds. And then the third setting is what's going to allow us to see our signal again. They want you to move this ground position down to the lowest dotted line on the screen. So you just do that with your position knob. You move that arrow along the left hand side right down to the lowest dotted line on the screen. And that now allows us to see our signal again. And the reason why they want you to do this is they were just increasing the size of the signal so that we can get a more accurate voltage value off the screen. So that's what you do next, is you want to calculate what the voltage of this signal is. So count up how many boxes high the signal is, multiply by your voltage scale setting, and then calculate what the voltage of the signal is. And finally for part A, they tell you to change the voltage of your Xantrex up and down and see what it does on the screen. Now in part B, you're using exactly the same circuit as you used in part A. The only thing is you're going to change the power supply. So right now you've got the Xantrex power supply plugged in. You're going to change this to a different power supply that puts out an AC signal. The signal you get may or may not be displayed nicely, so feel free to use the Auto Set button. And you will probably still want to actually stretch out your scale such that one waveform, one complete up and down oscillation, takes up as much of the screen horizontally as possible. So this is the function generator you're probably going to be using, and there's a bunch of stuff that the manual wants you to set on this. So the first thing they want you to set is the range. So the range is this set of buttons here. So they've got 1M for 1 megahertz, 100K for 100 kilohertz, and so on. 10K, 1K, 100, 10, 1. So you should set your range to 10K. So you just push in that button, and whatever else was selected will pop out automatically. They say set the number dial, which is this guy, to 2. So you set that to 2. You want to set the function to sine wave. So the function buttons are these three. You've got a square wave, a triangular wave, and a sine wave. So again, push in sine wave, whatever else was selected will pop out. The DC offset button is over here, that should be pushed in, so it can pop out or push in. You want it pushed in, and then you want it, and in fact the two next to it, set to mid-range values, which just means don't have it set right to the end of the scale, have it set anywhere in the middle. These two knobs will also be set in the middle, 
and these three buttons for now should all be popped out. So this one right now is pushed in, you can push it out or in. So all three, make sure they're popped out. To get your signal, you're going to connect to this BNC connector, which is labeled main. There's one called sync, but we don't want that. So you're going to hook into this one, and again, same deal, you take your BNC connector, slip it on, and then twist it until it clicks into place. And then you would hook up your wires to this. You turn it on with this button here. Now the objective in Part B is that you want to find the frequency of this waveform in three different ways and compare them to one another. So the first method is that you're going to count up how many boxes horizontally is equal to one complete up and down oscillation of the waveform. Then you multiply that by the time base scale and figure out what the period of this waveform is. And from the period, you could then calculate the frequency. So that's your first value of the frequency. The second frequency is just going to be the one that you set on your function generator. So 10,000 times whatever's on your dial. And finally, your third frequency value is just going to be the value that the scope gives you down here. So you compare those three values to see whether they agree well. And remember that the apparatus section of your lab manual lists the uncertainties for the oscilloscope and for the function generator. So part C is where we start doing some real physics. We're going to make an RC circuit, where R stands for resistance and C stands for capacitance. You'll be using a 1000 microfarad capacitor for this part of the experiment. So the first step is that we are going to connect our power supply via a switch to the capacitor. We want our voltage set to 12 volts to begin with. And we want to go from the positive end of the power supply to the switch and then to the positive end of the capacitor. Now just so you know, you have to be careful with the capacitors to hook them up correctly because if you hook them in backwards, they explode and spill their guts and make a bad smell and embarrass you in front of your lab instructor. So that would be bad. So just be careful that positive end goes to the positive end of the capacitor and negative end to negative end of the power supply. After you've hooked up the capacitor, then you hook up your resistance. Now the resistance for this circuit is supposed to be 9.9 .9 kilo ohms. So turn that up to 9, turn this one up to 9, double check that everything else has been set to 0, and then also you hook this up to the capacitor. And then from the resistor, you go on to your oscilloscope so you can look at this. And just keep positive to positive and negative to negative for the whole circuit. So that's your completed circuit. And what'll happen is when you press the tap key down, the capacitor very rapidly charges up to 12 volts. When you release it, then it's going to start discharging. That is, it'll have a voltage stored up and that'll drive the charge carriers through the resistor. However, this guy can't maintain 12 volts indefinitely like our power supply can. So his voltage will decay, which means the current will also decay over time. And we'll be able to watch that on our oscilloscope. So once you've got your circuit hooked up to the oscilloscope, they ask you to again press your menu button for channel 1, double check your settings, press the trigger menu button, double check those settings as well. And then they want you to use your vertical position knob to move the ground line down to this lowest horizontal line. They also ask you to make sure that your vertical scale is set to 2 volts and that your horizontal scale is set to 2.5 seconds, which is actually huge for these sorts of devices. So here I've got it finally set to 2.5 seconds. As you can see, that trace is moving across the screen extremely slowly. And that's important because when I press down the tap key and then release it, we're going to be able to watch that decay happening in real time. So one thing to notice about this is that when I get to this vertical bar over here, the trace is going to start redrawing itself over here. So there's a gap of about one space. There's also up here a run stop button. So what this does is if I press it, it freezes everything on the screen. If I press it again, it starts redrawing my trace from scratch. So what you'll be doing is you want to press down your tap key, set the trace going, and then release it and watch your decay. And we're going to wait until it decays totally, till it's over here, and then press run stop again in order to freeze this image on the screen. 
So there's my image, and we're going to take data off of this. So the way in which we take data is by using something new on the oscilloscope. Up here at the top, there's a button that says cursor. So you press that, and you want to set your type to time, like that. And this might be a little hard to see, but there's now two vertical lines on the screen. So cursor 1, I can also select cursor 2, and when you've got it selected, you can then use this knob to move it back and forth on the screen. So I can move those vertical lines around. So I'm going to put cursor 1 right at the very beginning of my decay curve, so right at 12 volts. Then I'll select cursor 2, and I'm going to move it, using this same knob, to the 10 volt horizontal line, so right about there. Over here, it says delta t equals 2 seconds, so it's actually telling me what the time difference between those two cursor locations are. So we're going to use this to get the data we need for our graph. So our first data point would be 12 volts, t equals 0. Our second data point would then be 10 volts, and the time for it is this 2 seconds. And then I can move the cursor 2 to a new location, and again, right here, it tells me the time difference between those two. So now I've got 8 volts and this time. So we can use those cursors to get all the data to make our graph. Now the objective of Part C is to calculate tau in three different ways. So one of the ways is by getting all of this data, and we're going to make a graph of it later. But the first way in which you're supposed to get tau is to calculate t1 half directly off your screen. T1 half is defined as the time it takes for the voltage to decay to one half of its original value. So if we started at 12 volts, then T1 half is the time it takes to get down to 6 volts. So you can find T1 half as part of your data taking. You could just move your cursor down to the 6 volt line, and then read T1 half directly off your screen. Once you've got T1 half, you can calculate tau, so that'll be your first tau value. You get your second tau value by graphing your data, but you're not going to graph voltage versus time, or that would just give you a curved line again. Instead, you're going to graph the natural logarithm of your voltage versus time. That should give you a straight line graph, and you can determine tau from the slope of the graph. Your third value of tau you're going to get by measuring the resistance and the capacitance. So you've been given a capacitance meter, and using this you can measure the capacitance directly. You've also been given a digital multimeter, and you can use this to measure the resistance directly. Once you measure R and C directly with the meters, then you can calculate your third value of tau, and then you should compare all three of your tau values to each other to see whether they agree within their limits of uncertainty. Now in Part D, we're building an RC circuit again with the same resistance value but with a much smaller capacitor. Now the problem with this circuit is that it decays so quickly that we can't really have a human controlling it with a tap key. We're just not fast enough. So we need to do something different. What we're going to do is instead of using the Xantrax, which would just give us 12 volts, we're going to use this function generator. And we're going to set it to give us a square wave, and we'll adjust things such that it's giving us a square wave that goes between 0 volts and 12 volts. So effectively, the function generator is going to be our tap key, turning the voltage on and off very quickly. We have to set things up carefully, because the default for a function generator when it's putting out an AC signal is that it would be symmetric, meaning it would go, say, between minus 6 volts and plus 6 volts, not between 0 volts and 12 volts. So before you build your circuit, you should hook up the function generator directly to the oscilloscope so you can make some adjustments. And I'm not going to be able to show you what's going on in the oscilloscope screen at the same time as I show you what I'm doing with the function generator, so I'll just tell you that you're going to be playing with these two knobs. One of them's the amplitude knob, and one is the DC offset. So the amplitude knob is what you'll use to get an output of 12 volts, and then the DC offset, you pull it out to engage it, and then you can twist it back and forth, and that's what will allow you to set the lower half of your square wave to 0 volts rather than minus 6 volts. So here's my function generator plugged directly into the oscilloscope, and I'm going to hit auto set to get things looking approximately right. Then you're going to start changing things on the function generator. So to begin with, you want to adjust the amplitude knob to make this signal 12 volts peak to peak. So when I change the amplitude knob on the function generator, I can adjust how big the signal is. So I want to adjust it until the whole signal is 12 volts peak to peak. Then I pull out the DC offset button on my oscilloscope, and that allows me to add DC to my signal. So this won't be necessarily very clear, 
but the ground line is right here on the middle line, and when I change the DC offset around, just the signal is moving, not the ground line, which means that I'm able to move this line here up to zero volts, which is what I want. Now there's one problem with that, and that is if I get a little too high, then my triggering goes wonky, because the triggering is also right here at the zero line. So if you raise your trigger level a little bit, then everything should be fine. So now I use that DC offset knob to put the bottom of the signal right on the ground line, because what I want is a square wave that goes between zero volts and 12 volts, and that's what I've got now. Of course, I can't really see much right now, so I'm gonna use this position knob now just to lower everything down so that ground is along the bottom dotted line. And once I've done that, then I can see my entire signal. And then finally, we press the trigger menu button, and we want to switch it from rising slope to falling slope. So now we can hook up our circuit and watch the decay of this new RC circuit. So now let me show you how to set up the circuit itself. So we can get rid of these for now. Just following along with the diagram in your lab manual, you go from the positive end of your function generator to the resistance, and then from the resistor to the positive end of your capacitor. And remember to make sure that you're hooking up the more positive end to the positive end of the capacitor, or you risk blowing this guy up. And then negative end to the negative end of the function generator. So that's our basic circuit there. And then we're gonna hook up the capacitor to our oscilloscope. So positive end to positive end, and negative end to negative end of the oscilloscope, and then we should be ready to take data. When you get your circuit hooked up to the oscilloscope, you may find that the screen doesn't quite look the way you want it to, but do not use the auto set button in this case. We still want the ground line along the bottom edge here, and we still want the slope for the trigger to be set to falling, and auto set will undo those settings. So instead, you're just gonna play around with the knobs to fix things. So first of all, use your position knob to move the trace this direction until you can see the beginning of your decay. And then you can use the horizontal scale to get it so you can see a little more of that. And I'll move it back again. And so there's my decay. They ask you to change your scale again so that you can see a couple of different waveforms on the screen at the same time and then they want you to sketch this. Now in the sciences, a sketch doesn't mean a quasi-artistic squiggle, it means exactly this on graph paper. So get a piece of graph paper, one block on the screen equals one block on your graph paper, and you put lines on there that exactly follow what these are doing. And don't forget to label your axes too. After you've done that, you can stretch out the trace again a little bit, and we're gonna use the cursors to again get some data off of this. So you press cursor and set your type to time again. And we want to get T1 half directly off the screen here. So cursor one, I'm going to set it right at the top of my decay curve. So that'll be right at 12 volts. And then T1 half is defined as the time it takes to get to half that value, which means I would want to put the second cursor on my six volt line. And once I've done that, I'll be able to read off T1 half from the screen. Once you get T1 half, you calculate tau, and they ask you to take that 12 volt square wave and change it to a 10 volt signal. You will have to change your DC offset again when you do this. But you change the square wave to a 10 volt signal, and then go and find T1 half and tau for that as well. Compare them to the value you got for this 12 volt signal, and see whether they've changed. And think about that for a second. Should they have changed? You can probably answer this based on what you know of the theory. And again, for your third value of tau, you're going to measure R and C directly using the two meters that you've been given. And then compare the tau value that you calculate from R and C to the two other values you have.